Good morning, everyone. Please sit. Right, good morning to everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to uh, you all here today. Members of Year 13 who are joining us in person, members of the school who are joining us virtually, um, and to everyone else uh, who will see this service, parents, governors, and alumni, you are, for, you are all very welcome. As is our tradition at Bay Grammar School, we come together as one school community today. We come together to remember all those who have lost their lives in conflict around the world. Our assembly this year takes place during challenging times, but our duty to remember remains unchanged. We remember those who have come to be known as our fallen swans, our old boys who died during the Great War and the Second World War, old boys who we promise never to forget. We are immensely proud when we hear of their courage. Courage, a sometimes overused word these days, but let us remember their courage in context. War is nasty, savage and brutal. It is about who can kill the most and win battles. And some of those fallen swans had barely left school, some the same age as our year 13 here before us today. When you pass the honours boards and the fallen swans installation in the headmaster's corridor, think on, think on and reflect. Reflect about the meaning of duty and service. Reflect about what they fought and died for, democracy and liberty. And be proud of those Berry Grammar School boys who gave their lives for their country, our fallen swans. We shall remember them. In Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below we are the dead short days ago we lived felt dawn saw sunset glow loved and were loved and now we lie in flanders fields Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Last Wednesday, Her Majesty the Queen visited Westminster Abbey in the heart of London. During her long reign, the Queen has visited the Abbey many times for great events such as royal weddings, state funerals and national services of, of thanksgiving and commemoration. By contrast, her visit last week was a very small scale and personal occasion. Wearing a face mask for the first time in public and accompanied only by two others, her military servant or equerry and the Dean of Westminster, she made her way to a grave in a prominent position just by the western entrance to the Abbey. In its thousand year history, the Abbey has provided the last resting place for many of Britain's kings and queens, famous scientists, poets, writers and politicians. But it was not one of these that the Queen had come to see. In fact, the grave she visited has no one's name on it. The great black marble slab above it simply says, a British warrior, unknown by name or rank. On the grave, the queen laid a wreath of myrtle and orchids, the flowers featured in her own wedding bouquet. But who is this unknown warrior? How did he come to be buried in Westminster Abbey? And why, last week, did the queen lay a copy of her own wedding bouquet on his grave? The origin of the Unknown Warrior lies in the incredible outpouring of grief resulting from the tragic loss of life in the First World War, or the Great War, as it was then known. That terrible conflict ended 102 years ago today, the 11th of November 1918, when an armistice or truce came into effect at 11am. Even in the midst of a global pandemic, 
it is difficult for us to imagine the scale of loss suffered in that war. Three quarters of a million service personnel from Britain alone had died, and twice that number had been wounded, many severely. Scarcely anyone in the country had not been touched by the loss of a relative, a friend, or a colleague. To give some indication, small indication of the degree of loss, our school First World War Memorial comm commemorates 98 former pupils who died in that war. In 1914, at the outbreak of war, the Boys Senior School had 165 pupil pupils in total. Listed on the memorial are six pairs of brothers, an uncle and nephew, and the 1914 and 1915 school captains. Some of them named were their parents' only children. The youngest was a 16-year-old merchant sailor, Fred Hyde. Three of them had survived the fighting, only to die in the virulent influenza pandemic which ravaged the war-weary country in 1918 and 1919 and killed a further quarter of a million people. Unlike COVID-19, the flu was particularly deadly to younger adults. To make matters worse, in many cases, the grieving families did not even have the slim comfort of knowing what had happened to their loved one or the knowledge that they had received a proper burial with a marked grave that they, which they might one day visit to pay their respects. Up to a half of those who had been killed were the missing, those whose bodies were obliterated by shell fire, swallowed up in the muddy battlefields of Belgium and France, or lost in the depths of the sea. Even where a body was recovered from the shattered landscape of the battlefields, it was frequently unrecognisable. No fewer than 38 of the 98 old boys commemorated on our Great War Memorial, and 11 of the 47 who died in the Second World War have no known grave. Each of them was a brother, a son, a husband, a fiancé, most of them just embarking on what should have been full, fulfilling and long adult lives. They include Herbert Bridge. Herbert Bridge came from a large and very mu musical family from Haymarket Street in Bury. His brother Jack, a violinist, rose to become leader of the world-famous Halle Orchestra in Manchester. After leaving Berry Grammar School, Herbert originally trained as a hairdresser, but eventually became a professional musician himself, playing the double bass in bands and orchestras across the country. During the First World War, he enlisted in the army as Private Herbert Bridge, C Company, 7th Yorkshire Light Infantry. In September 1917, his unit was stationed near the Belgian town of Ypres, familiar to many of you from our annual school battlefield tours, in the midst of the terrible battle known as Passchendaele. On the 20th of September, he wrote to his sister Amy back home. Dear Amy, thanks very much indeed for the food parcel, which was very good of you to send. I am sorry to say that I did not get it until yesterday, the 19th, so you see it was spoiled. I can't tell you how much I was hurt to see it. The reason was, I have been for eight days where they can't get parcels up to us. I did not come out again until the 18th. Never mind, there are a lot of things much worse indeed than that out here. You see, we do not often go into the front line for so long. And if any time you would like me to send another parcel, I should just like you to send a cake or a bit of parking. And if it happens to be held upon the way, it will not spoil. I had a letter from Brother Harry the other day, but I have not answered him yet. He says he is fairly well. I have no idea where he is, but I hope he is not in such a hot place as this. We have, been, we have been right in the thick of it lately, but I am more than pleased to say that I am very fortunate indeed so far. I sincerely hope it will be God's will that I will come home again, and at the end, which I sometimes think will be a long time off, and then at other times I can see it hardly lasting long, over some terrifically hard fighting now. Even now, a big shell has gone over my head and burst a hundred yards further on. Of course, I take not a bit of notice of it, those things now. The night before they were bursting only a, few, only a very few yards away from me. I hope this war will soon be over and we can have peaceful times again, but I am in the same mind as the Prime Minister, Lloyd George. We shall have to smash the Germans first before we can have a lasting peace. It would indeed be a sin if another generation had to go such terrible times as these. So you see, we must beat the Huns before we talk of peace. I think it will be another winter first, but I hope I am wrong, and it will finish before that, as the winter is awful here. I suppose you have been having some awful holiday weather this August. I had a letter from Florian Edna the other day, and they told me about you having been all the way to the seaside and I hope you will have enjoyed yourselves and the change will have done you good. I know you all worry a lot, but whatever happens, please don't, because there is not a bit of use to making yourselves miserable. Well, of course, you know we can't say very much. I hope you will please excuse more just now and the awful writing, as I am writing under difficulties. 
Hoping these few lines will hear you happy and well. I am Amy, your affectionate brother, Herbert. The next day, 21st of September 1917, Herbert Bridge was reported missing. He never received the cake or the piece of parking from his sister or saw any of his relatives again. He was later presumed dead. The family, who have kept his last letter in pristine condition ever since, never found out anything more about the circumstances of his death. When I was researching the Great War Roll of Honour of Berry Grammar School a hundred years later, a careful search of his unit war diary and other military records left me none the wiser. Herbert Bridge simply vanished from the face of the earth. He is one of seven BGS old boys commemorated on the massive Tynecott Memorial to the Missing near Passchendaele. He has no known grave. It was in some small way to meet the needs of families like those of Herbert Bridge that the idea of the unknown warrior took hold. It was the brainchild of a clergyman, the Reverend David Railton, who served as a British Army chaplain on the Western Front. In early 1916, he was struck by seeing a grave marked with a wooden cross behind the house where he was staying. On it was inscribed, an unknown British soldier. Reflecting on this and the fact that the soldier's family would not know what had happened to him, Railton came up with the idea of returning one of the thousands of unknown soldiers from the battlefields for burial in Britain as a memorial to all those who had been lost. Each family could regard the unknown warrior as possibly their own relative, and in this way it might act as a symbol and focus of their grief. The idea faced many difficulties, and it was not until the autumn of 1920 that a plan to return a body for burial in Westminster Abbey was finally accepted by the government. After this, events moved quickly as the burial was scheduled to take place on the second anniversary of the armistice, 11th of November 1920. There then followed a highly secretive selection plan, the details of which are not fully known a century later, the idea being that the identity of the warrior must never be known. A number of unknown British soldiers were taken from the war cemeteries then being constructed on the major battlefields of the Western Front. The bodies were transported at night to a British military HQ in France where at midnight a general selected one at random. At that point, that anonymous soldier, whoever he was, was transformed forever into the unknown warrior. The chosen body was transported to the French port of Boulogne where it was placed in a coffin of British oak secured by iron bands weighing over 100 kilograms. On top was placed a medieval sword from the personal collection of King George V, the present Queen's grandfather. The warrior was then taken across the Channel to Dover on a Royal Navy warship, and then by a special train to London. All along the route, the public turned out to pay their respects. On the 11th of November, 1920, Armistice Day, 100 years ago today, the coffin was placed on a gun carriage and escorted by troops with King George V walking behind the carriage as chief mourner. It was taken through the streets of London, watched by massive crowds, stopping at the new Cenotaph Memorial in Whitehall and then to Westminster Abbey. There it was met by a guard of honour formed by nearly 100 holders of the Victoria Cross and 100 women who had lost their husbands or all of their sons in the war. As the coffin was lowered into the grave, the king scattered soil from France from a silver shell as the last post in Revalli, which we shall hear in a moment, was played. By 27th of November 1920, one and a half million people had filed past the grave. A year later, a permanent slab of Belgian black marble was placed on the tomb. Its final words are, they buried him among the kings because he had done good towards God and towards his house. That then is the reason why Her Majesty the Queen visited Westminster Abbey last week. The original plan had been to recreate the procession of the unknown warrior through London on the original route, but of course that idea had to be abandoned because of the coronavirus pandemic. But why did the Queen lay a wreath based on her wedding bouquet? Well, in 1923, Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon married the future King George VI at Westminster Abbey. As she was leaving the church, she laid her wedding bouquet on the grave of the unknown warrior. This was in remembrance for her beloved brother, Fergus Bowes Lyon, who was killed in 1915 and had no known grave. This tradition has been carried on by all royal brides married at the Abbey since, including Elizabeth Bowes Lyon's daughter, the present Queen in 1947, and the Duchess of Cambridge in, 19, in 2012. 
The mystery and genius of the unknown warrior is that he might be Fergus Bowes Lyon, he might be Herbert Bridge, he might be my great uncle Cyril, my nan's beloved brother, or any of those thousands lost in the chaos of war and known only to God. Would you please stand? <clears throat> In a few moments, we shall undertake our traditional act of remembrance for 11th of November, the laying of a wreath in honour of all those from this school who have given their lives in the service of this country, and for us in the two world wars and other conflicts. We shall hear the reading of the exhortation, the poem extract from the poem For the Fallen by Lawrence Binion, which is traditionally recited at remembrance occasions. And that will be followed by the last post, a minute's silence, and Ravalli, as was heard at the state funeral of the unknown warrior exactly a century ago today. I would also ask you to remember all those who continue to suffer from the scourge of war, including the present conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Syria, and other places around the world. This year, as the headmaster said, is a very unusual and trying year. During the present coronavirus pandemic, we should also remember the NHS and other frontline staff who have given their lives in the struggle against what is an invisible enemy. I should say that the flags at Berry Grammar School are being lowered to half mast for the 11 o'clock minute silence. Now, if we could hear the exhortation by Lawrence Binion. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. <clears throat> 